Well, have you ever gone to war against another Christian? The question at first pass seems quite ludicrous. Fellow Christians are co-laborers with one another. Fellow Christians are spiritual siblings to one another. We are members together of the body of Christ. We're called not to wage war against one another, but to wage war arm in arm together. We're not to dwell in disunity, but unity with one another. And yet the question remains on the table, have you ever gone to war against another Christian? The answer for many of us is yes. Not physical war, to be sure, but verbal war, perhaps. Hurtful words you've spoken to another Christian's face or said behind another Christian's back. Subtle war, a cold shoulder you've given to another Christian, a look of disinterest you've shown them, a turning away slightly whenever they walk through the door. Or maybe most commonly, inner war, kind and cordial on the outside. Yet on the inside, you're telling them a thing or two. You're showing them how wrong they are. You're gaining ahead of them in terms of position and status. You're winning on the inside. What could possibly provoke a quarrel between two souls for whom Christ died? What could ever cause such a foolish war? James asks that question. And he gives an answer. James says in chapter 4, verse 1, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? Are your passions are at war within you? Your passions, James says, are the biggest reason for your war. Not their bad attitude. Not their prickly personality, but your passions. Your desire for worldly praise and worldly power and worldly comfort. All those things that it seems that other person is getting in your way of having. All those things that now seem hard for you to get because of that other person now in your life. All those things that you now begin to covet. Because they have it, and you don't, and that bothers you. The agitation rises, the offense grows, and it leads you to fight and to quarrel with that other person. Here's the principle. Foolish treasures breed foolish wars. Treasuring whatever can be spent upon our worldly passions that others are always seeming to get in the way of you having. Brothers and sisters, James tells us that if worldly passions continue to be our treasures, quarrels with other Christians will continue to be our wars. Because here's the thing. If tomorrow you were suddenly to obtain all those things that that person has supposedly been keeping you from, you're to have them all. That great marriage, that nice house, that cushy job, that impressive status. You would not be happy with those treasures. You wouldn't. Soon enough, you would find yourself in yet another war with yet another Christian over yet another supposed treasure that they are now getting in the way of you of having. Your foolish treasures will continue to incite foolish wars because unsatisfied souls are those who take up arms against one another. The satisfied soul feels no need to. Friends, if your war is ever going to end, it will be due not to a change in your circumstances, but to a change in your treasures. The only way for you to quit warring and quit coveting and quit seeking to spend upon your, your passions is to re 
crown Jesus as your one and only treasure. Because no person, not even that person, can ever get in the way of you having him and fullest satisfaction in him. Let's pray. Father, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. You tell us that. We wrestle against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness. We're not to fight against one another. We're to fight the good fight of faith. Not for worldly passions, but for the crown that you award to those who love you and pursue you to the end. We confess this morning for our bickering, for our fighting, for our coveting, for our warring with other souls who you love. And for all the other ways we've sinned this morning, we've fallen short of your glory. God, we bring those things to you now in this moment of silent confession. Father, we trust that you love us. We trust that you receive us. We trust that we are yet still your children. And it's because of who you are that we rest in comfort, even as we bring our sins to you this morning. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and it's his name we pray. Amen. All right, I want to invite you now, as you are able, to stand for the assurance of pardon. Church, this morning we have confessed our sins, and so hear the good news. God tells us in his word that when we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, this morning, who all who humbly seek the mercy of God, I say to you, in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven.